And of course, there's middle class furniture as well. And here we're covering again the middle class and some of the working class looking at some of the innovations that the average person would have. Now, inside an entryway, you would typically see something like this. It's often termed a coat hanger or a parlor or a uh, entry chair. But it's an interesting piece and it's innovative for the time, although they're going to be decorated in a number of different forms. What you have are coat hangers around the side, a mirror, a seat, and usually storage under the seat. The idea is shoes go in the storage. You sit down, you put on your shoes, because of course you don't want to wear them in the house. You can take one last glance in the mirror before you go outside or before you answer the door. You grab your coat, etc., and you walk out the door. You see a lot of these in uh, starting in the Victorian through this period, they become very popular in this period from about World War I through 1960. We will see the rise of living room suites, the idea that maybe my living room should entirely match, so I should buy it as a set. Now, this idea of the living room suite has existed since the Victorian, but in Victorian times, you would have seven, eight, nine different pieces associated with it. Uh, between a sofa, the chairs, the tables, and everything else. They're living in smaller homes, especially in the suburbs. And as a consequence of that, what you do is you start cutting down what is necessary for a living room suite. So for many of us today, it might be a couch, maybe a love seat, and a chair, and that's it. Whereas in the Victorian, you would have benches and stools and ottomans and all sorts of other pieces. So we've boiled it down to oftentimes a three-piece set. We will see the development of the Davenport sofa. Now we saw this a little bit from the Jenny Lind, uh, that pull-out couch idea, and that's going back to our turn of the century arts and crafts Art Nouveau. But what's different here is this is a fold-out rather than a slide-out. And it folds out to create basically a double bed or a double size bed. The advantage is now I can take care of house guests in a house that may not have guest rooms, which would have been very common in Victorian homes, but of course are less common in the post-war smaller houses uh, and post-World War I uh, smaller homes. So as a consequence, you get the pullout. And this is, of course, very common as well today. It's very uh, amusing to lock people into them. Don't, don't actually do that. It's probably a bad idea, but it's fun when they're sleeping. Then we see the use of the sideboard, which will eventually transition by the 1950s to a china cabinet. The transition happens because the china cabinet is more useful than the sideboard. We have smaller families in these homes, so I don't need the extra buffet space that a sideboard gives me. But I want to keep up with the Joneses because I'm in the middle class and that's what we do. So I get a china cabinet. And the china cabinets and sideboards of this period, of course, will mix different styles and ideas. These are kind of federal period. Maybe there's a mix of ideas here between the fixtures, the use of the oval decoration, the undulating front, but moving aside, moving along from that. What we have with the china cabinet is the ability to show off my fine china, but still have the storage of the sideboard. I'm giving up the extra space that would typically be used for serving food. But since I'm not having as many guests and I have a smaller dining room, if any, it just makes more sense to have a china cabinet in the area. Also, we're getting more and more so-called fast and ready-made meals. So think TV dinners and that sort of thing. They're being invented in the 1950s and 60s. So there's less need for that large layout of a big Sunday dinner. We will see the rise of bedroom sets. Now, early in this period, uh, going back to the World War I period, not everyone has interior plumbing, which means oftentimes we will have some kind of vanity or dresser with mirror. We will then have oftentimes some form of cupboard. And this cupboard was actually developed to hide the chamber pot that you would use 
at night to go to the bathroom. Of course, you can't go out to the outhouse or whatever other facilities you have. And then you would have some additional storage. And the bed, the cabinet or cupboard, and the dresser or vanity should all match in terms of style. Now, these will change over time. This cupboard will be replaced with a dresser. The vanity eventually will disappear. Uh, but the idea of having matching furniture, again, is going to appeal to the middle and working class because I can order it once and it becomes the tradition, and it's a very new tradition starting in the 1920s, to order a bedroom set when you get married and then use it throughout your life. So you only order it once. Now, as we move further along, when we get into the 1920s, the 1930s, and the 1940s, we see a move towards brass beds. The reason is they're uh, going to be particularly sanitary. At the time, a Montgomery Ward catalog talks about how bacteria and germs can get into wood and live there. That's not entirely true, but the end point is actually surprisingly modern. Brass is antibacterial, and so they sell these beds as being more sanitary than a wood bed, uh, which is why grandma may well have a brass bed sitting up in the guest room somewhere in her house. We will see a continuation of the use of wardrobes. Now, this will fade out as we move into the 1950s and 60s, and we see more built-in closets. But wardrobes will continue to be very common. They can be massive pieces, but they're increasingly cheaply made, which is why we don't see a lot of wardrobes coming out of the 20th century in really good shape. The wood gets thinner and thinner, and the construction methods will change. Then we have the rise of particle board. Yes, particle board. What they do in manufacturing is basically use particle board, throw a veneer over it initially. Nowadays, we actually just put paper over it uh, and create this so-called synthetic wood. It makes sense from a manufacturing and environmental perspective. We can use far more of the tree if we're not using solid boards, but we know that it doesn't stand up real well. And this is, of course, the entire basis of IKEA. But that being said, it does serve a purpose, which is that it allows the middle and working class to have furniture that at least looks good, even if it's not going to last terribly long, that looks good and can easily fit a style. So it does have a place to a point. Of course, it has its downfalls as well. Uh, the fact that it comes from Ikea, first of all, although I know Souter and other uh, Walmart and such, you can get particle board. But if it gets wet, it of course falls apart. It is not a very strong material. So under certain circumstances, you can easily break the pieces. And today we actually have replaced particle board in certain settings, <coughs> Ikea with what is basically cardboard. If you open up a piece of Ikea, which is a good hobby, especially in the store, they love that, you'll discover that there's actually cardboard inside and most of it is nothing more than open space. Same basic idea. But it does allow the middle classes and the working classes to have the accessibility to fairly modern looking furniture without spending the money for either the material, the solid wood, or the artisan, the, the carpenter, to build it. <laughs> 